Uh, good afternoon. My name is Hirsch Lebo, and I have the privilege today of interviewing Milton Mann, a longtime resident of Stanford, who lives on Studio Road. And this is for the Jewish Historical Society of Lower Fairfield County's archives. Mr. Mann, Milton, as he's well known, has consented to be interviewed today. And this incidentally is the 67th anniversary of Pearl Harbor Day. If you remember Pearl Harbor, 1941, December the 7th. Milton, good afternoon. How are you, Harry? It's a privilege to be here. Thank you for inviting us. My tell me, Milton, this is an unusual home that you live in. Could you tell us a little bit about the background? Uh, well, I got some Borgum lift here. Who is he? Uh, he's the uh, chap that designed Mount Rushmore. And the models that were used in making Mount Rushmore were made right here. In addition to which, uh, Borglum um, created uh, statues that are all over the country. Uh, fascinating man and someone that uh, uh, has a, quite an interesting history. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very, very interesting and certainly historical. Uh, your parents uh, weren't born in this country, were they? No. Where were they born? Both the mother and father were born in Krakow, Poland. And came over here? Uh, uh, slightly before the uh, First World War. Uh, and where, did, where were you born, Milton? Uh, we were born in the Bronx, T-H-E. And what year, what's your birthday? Uh, May 15, 1927. Mm -hmm. And uh, you grew up in the Bronx, you went to school there. I, I noticed you went to uh, the uh, Boston, not Boston, I'm sorry. The, uh, we went uh, to the uh, uh, New York's uh, Bronx High, School, Bronx of High Science. School of Science. That's uh, what I was trying to get out. And uh, Well, you must have been a good student to get in there. It's very interesting. There are, uh, high schools throughout the city, but there are a couple of high schools. It was Townsend Harris, Stuyvesant High, and the Bronx High School of Science, which were uh, schools that you had to have grades and uh, tests to enter. Right. It was an all-boys school. Right now it's a co-ed and still in existence. I, I know you were in the Army talking about Pearl Harbor Day. You were in there from when to when? Uh, 1944 to 1946, two years, <coughs> 11 days, 17 hours. <coughs> Had you gone overseas at all? or you were? Yeah, we were stationed in uh, Germany. We were part of the uh, occupation force. And we had... Uh, I was a terrible uh, uh, language student, but somehow the government thought I was qualified to learn Japanese. Uh, because we dropped the atomic bomb, they uh, came to the conclusion we didn't need more translated, so we never did go to school. You didn't have to uh, have any uh Exposure to the concentration camps while you were over training, did you? No, we we had two experiences. The first was uh, we actually was in Nuremberg and we actually saw the Nuremberg war crime trials trials uh, on a one week visit, and uh, it it was very strange as a Jew to be sitting next to the people that perpetrated what they did. The other thing was we did go to Poland and we did see the concentration camps, but you know, in, in later years. Mm -hmm. So this wasn't when you were horrible, in service? Well, I think, to see. Was it after you came out of service that you went to college? Or part of your college? Uh, it's after service, although I was in a uh, ASTP program, 
which permitted me to get a year's school uh, at Norwich University. In Vermont. That was a courtesy of the Army. That was where? In Vermont? It's in Vermont. Right. And then you went to college here in the States? Uh, uh, we went afterwards, after getting out of service, uh, Bernard Root School of Business Administration. Right. And then what did you study uh, in college and what was your profession? Uh, I wanted to be an engineer, but it turned out that uh, my uh, father died and didn't have the luxury of going to a uh, science school. So uh, we took up business and uh, uh, became, had a BBA and was uh, practiced in the practice, went into the practice of accounting, I see. became a CPA. Tell me a little bit about your, your family. Your parents came over from? Uh, Krakow, Poland. Poland, and they met here? And right. They, what? They, uh, they were both uh, diamond setters, and uh, they met at work. And How many children did they have? They had three boys. Did they uh, call them their three diamonds, or? <laughs> uh, I was the oldest of uh, the three boys. Then we had Irving, my uh, uh, four-year younger brother, and he was a school teacher working with uh, mentally retarded children. And my third brother was Kenneth, Kenny, and he was an artist. He worked for some of the uh, very impressive uh, magazines. Medical Economics, one you probably know. Uh, and it was an art magazine that's very famous. And your brothers are still alive? or No, unfortunately both of them died at age 42. Uh, which is a horrible trauma to have as a memory. But, uh, but you have a lot of your brother's art, I noticed in the right. house. And right. He, uh, he was artist, an artist. He uh, uh, published a book with a very famous uh, uh, fellow named Charles Mead. Uh, who wrote a, mag uh, a very popular book, uh, Nafternoon and Potsdam, uh, and it was called uh, Happy Birthday, Baby Jesus. Uh, and it was a very popular book with Kenny's cartoons. Uh, my mother was upset about that he would do a Happy Birthday, Baby Jesus, so his next book, a children's book, was called Moses, Moses, and then he did a novel. Okay. Uh, I noticed that um, you had some, we had quite a few relatives in, in the Bronx. Is any one of them particularly uh, important in your life or in steering you towards your profession or? I one uh, uncle and Uncle Ben, uh, who was a furrier by profession, who had to uh, retire at a uh, early age because he had TB, I guess, from the industry. Uh, he was somebody who admired me, uh, who I admired. <clears throat> and. Uh, uh, was someone who I could look for, for guidance. Mm -hmm. And you met Norma, your wife, uh, yeah. where in the Bronx? Yes, I met her on April Fool's Day at uh, a fraternity party. And uh, we've been together right. and for a short period of time, something like 56 years. I was going to ask, what's, your, what's the date of your marriage? You remember? No. <laughs> no, I, I have it somewhere else in one of my computers. I see. All right. But how many years have you been married? 
56. 56 years. God bless you and all of And what brought you here to Stanford? Well, it, uh, I was in the CPA uh, field. Uh, I had worked down in the Wall Street area and uh, uh, took an audit up in the Stanford area. Uh, I think I had a uh, job that was above my uh, qualifications or experience, but I had a car which uh, justified my employer from sending me up here. And uh, I was warned by this very, uh, my uh, boss, that the person I was coming to work for was a tough, tough person and you're making a mistake by leaving the CPA profession to work for this uh, real estate firm. It was headed up at the time by a uh, Jesse Hartman. What was the name of the firm? Remember? Well, in real estate you have multiple uh, names. You do a project and you uh, uh, give it an identity. And the first job that we were involved with, or the <clears throat> I started as an audit, as an independent auditor, was Fairlawn. And that was, again, 52 years ago. Uh, and it was like the first major housing development that took place after the war. Uh, it was uh, how, uh, it was a development that required waiting lists to get into. Uh, what year was this? Well, About. let's work back for the '52 from away. So it's it's the 1956. Six. And, uh, Is that when you moved up here in 1956? Or? Right. My, uh, part of my employment was a, uh, a two, my compensation was a two bedroom apartment. I see. Which we uh, uh, had, where we had our first uh, child. And how many children do you have? Uh, we have three daughters. Three daughters. And how many grandchildren? Uh, eight. Very good. Now, does Fairlawn still exist? Does oh, yes. Fairlawn still exist? It's, um, it became a condominium. It was a rental, it was built as a rental job. And uh, it's still there, it's still... So what was Stanford like when you first came up here? What are your well, most immediate memories of Stanford? Stanford was, had a population of about 33,000 people. It was a small town. If you were coming up from New York, you would take the Post Road or the Merritt Parkway. At about that time, uh, I-95 was built. And uh, our first buildings, part of Fairlawn, was on the Post Road. But you could see I-95, and I thought it was a boondoggle because there were no cars on I-95 when it started. Uh, what sort of traffic? Minimal traffic. Very uh, people seemed not to uh, ride it. Mm -hmm. uh, needless to say, uh, I-95 now could be a parking lot. So your primary business became not for CPA, although you did that? I continued my CPA practice uh, just to keep my finger in but as your a main, professional. But, but your main business became? My first job and business as controller was uh, in real estate. Real estate. Is it, so I you had you continue a, with that? Uh, the accounting firm was a nighttime, part-time job, but actually even exists today. Uh, 
it's called Man and Company. And uh, we had several partners through the period of time. And uh, it's, it kept me going. And your real estate company, what is that called? Uh, again, it had different names, but uh, we primarily started in uh, building uh, townhouses. So uh, there was uh, the par uh, apartments called, and rentals, and there was Daycroft Apartments, there was Hamilton Gardens, Hanover Hall. Now, ha the, uh, we stopped building townhouses and started to build high-rises. And the high-rises included uh, Hoyt Bedford. And Hoyt Bedford was on a street that, that uh, not, short, uh, not long afterwards had a dirt road on it. It's only in recent times, well, it's where our courthouse okay. is, the police station. And it's now a very heavily trafficked street. Tell me, what else uh, were you involved in? Any uh, big projects? Uh, well, uh, not that they're small. This is uh, uh, it, Beerabine. It's a firm. The firm was made up of this Jesse Hartman, and it was a Lloyd Fowler, F O W L E R, and myself, and it was a partnership. But uh, uh, it was, uh, one of the things that we did was Stanford went through a urban redevelopment period. And I think one of the exciting things was we were involved in the first urban redevelopment project that began and finished, com was completed. It was an industrial uh, development, which was the site which used to be the dumping grounds of Stanford. Where was so, that located? Down in Harborview. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the first tenants in there, in fact, the first tenant who now is a very uh, famous uh, a tenant, Clairol, had its beginning in one of the industrial parks that we were involved in. Did you tell me at one time that you had something to do with the old Stanford Railroad Station? Uh, yes. Uh, the uh, first, uh, we, uh, the, the company called Transportation Plaza Associate, Associates bought the Stanford Railroad Station in bankruptcy. And uh, we had dreams of building a Grand Central office building on top of the station uh, with uh, parking for the commuters and so on. Uh, there was a mayor, Tom Serrani, who thought differently and uh, condemned the station in order that the city of Stanford itself would have a chance to build it. And uh, that was an interesting experience, but... Uh, uh, interesting in what way? You mean interesting fighting in the city? Interesting that the city, or? we felt the city didn't do as... They did a terrible job in building the commuter station. And for a while, the, the thought was that the station would fall apart. The, they did it very poorly. So one of our thoughts was, maybe under different circumstances, uh, we could have done a better job. But it was a challenge. And just looking back on your career in real estate, can you point out any project that you're most proud of or thought well, I think that added uh, most to the welfare of the city? I think that the housing that we brought to Stanford was the 
big challenge. Uh, it was timely, maybe it was the beginning of what changed Stanford, uh, because for the most part it was affordable housing. And uh, one of the interesting things was, and I can't quite date it, was when the Russian Jews were being brought out from Russia because of oppression. And uh, although we had uh, a non-discriminating policy, uh, we managed to bring a lot of the uh, Jews, provide housing for those Jews uh, that came. So at one point, our Hanover Hall project was uh, known as Little Odessa, and the Russians would be sitting around uh, the pool area and the open area with their black hats and uh, would be speaking in Russia, Russian. So that was one thing we reflect on. I know that uh, you and Norma are very charitable people and have been very active in uh, life here, Jewish life particularly in, in Stanford. Um, I don't mean to embarrass you, but could you tell me about some of the things that you've been involved in? Well, we're members of Temple Bethel. Uh, we've worked with the temple. We had a two year stint as uh, president of the temple. At the same time that Norma was involved heading up our federation. So we would meet in the night after our uh, volunteer work. Uh, can't, can't recall all the years, I, but uh, we've been involved with the uh, Stanford Ho Hospital. In what way? Uh, uh, on different boards. We were on the finance committee for a couple of years. Uh, we did volunteer work for uh, St. Luke's, uh, again, in housing. I know you're also affiliated with the uh, Yale uh, Eye Center. Uh, yeah, our current involvement is in uh, the Yale Eye Center. We're on a board. Uh, we're uh, front fundraising for uh, the problems and the causes and of uh, glaucoma and uh, other diseases of the macular eye. degeneration. Macular degeneration, yes. And uh, I know I've taken advantage of it. I've attended some of the lectures that you've sponsored. Uh, just mention those. Uh, at uh, UConn, we've been involved, the norm has been involved from the uh, inception of the uh, uh, UConn, this, not this, uh, uh, the... Uh, you take in Middle East? The Yukon uh, courses, lectures, that, lectures that, that have Jewish subjects that are involved. I think uh, Norm, Norm Eskenazi runs that, mm -hmm. a Professor Eskenazi, I yeah. think, runs that. Uh, no, Norm Eskenazi. No, yeah, right. What, in your opinion, uh, has been the biggest change in Jewish uh, relations here and, and what's happened to uh, the Jewish community in Stanford? Uh, I'd like to say it's coalescing, co getting uh, closer to each other. But basically, the community is trying to uh, unify itself. Uh, it's well run, it's active. You like
right to think that more Jews would be involved with more things. Uh, I don't think that's really happened. I'd say though, if I had to speculate, I'd say one third of the population truly identifies in the community, uh, but that one third is very active. Have you ever encountered anti-Semitism uh, here in Stanford? Uh, of course, these are, these are your working days, uh, not going back to when you were a child, but uh, in your business relations or? Not really. I've, uh, I've heard of it. You never are very sensitive to what other people feel about you. So, I, w I would say no. I think we live in a relatively liberal community. Well, Milton, we've covered a lot of a lot of subjects. Uh, what do you do for leisure time? What are your activities? Well, one of the things I uh, love is uh, sailing and uh, swimming, and in sailing, uh, we race, we race competitively, uh, belong to the Halloween Yacht Club, which is a, uh, a city facility, it's, it's not a fancy yacht club, but uh, uh, every Thursday night during the summer, spring and fall, you'll see us on our boat called Rights of Man, and we uh, compete. It's, uh, I'd say, 15 boats, more or less, and uh, we go out to buoy 32, which is right here in the Sound. Uh, the gun goes off at 7 o'clock. We sail with our, quote, sailing buddies, and have a good time, uh, go back to the club, enjoy uh, some wine and hors d'oeuvres. So it's a pleasant thing that we've been priv privileged to do for a good number of years. Uh, How big is your boat? Uh, it's a 34-foot uh, sloop. And, uh, in the summer, we also go out to, uh, on our one-week, two-week cruises. We've cruised as far as Maine. Uh, there are challenges, um, and for a good number of years, Norma and I, on our cruises, have been the two on the boat. Uh, it's Long Island Sound, I feel, is a fantastic location and one of the greatest assets of living in Stanford. Uh, in recent years, I've uh, taken up golf and uh, had the privilege of uh, taking lessons from Mr. Hirsch Lebo. Uh, but seriously, it, it's a fun, uh, it, we have, again, in Stanford, a blessing. We have two great golf courses. Uh, the Stir Sterling Farms uh, is superior in quality, I think, to some of the very private clubs, very expensive private clubs that are in the community. Um, because of that, before, because of the fact that uh, uh, we played tennis for a good number of years during the summer, uh, we never had time nor an incl inclination to join the, uh, the uh, golf club up the line called Rock Rimmon. Uh, so, 
we, we like our sports. The swimming is, uh, we're uh, blessed with a pool out front and during the summer we make a point of getting into the pool before we go to work. So you're a good swimmer? No. <laughs> but you love to swim? I love to swim. Are you still bike riding? Uh, yes. How far do you go? Well, uh, there is, again, Stanford is a beautiful community and our neighbor even. So there was a ride we've done on uh, a regular basis, but not uh, for, for various reasons, not so much this year, um, called the Three Reservoirs. And uh, it's that, it, we leave from here, go past Temple Sinai, uh, and then work your way up into the, what I call the woods of Stanford. Uh, it's quite a ride, and there are bike clubs that are in this community. Do you ever go back to where you first lived here in Stanford? And uh, where was that? I've taken our children, and our children are not children anymore, but as little children, yes, I've took, taken them back to the Bronx. Uh, the, the house, the apartment house we lived in is now, for all purposes, a bombed out shelter. Uh, and the other shocking thing that we've talked about was the, uh, the noise that the Jerome Avenue elevator uh, uh, trains made that we were oblivious of as as children, but again, we enjoyed our youth and didn't really appreciate the fact that we had poverty. Where, where were your children born? Were they born uh, all in Stanford or in the Bronx? Or uh, our first child was born in the Bronx. Uh, Norma was is a social, was a social worker and uh, for the city of New York and uh, we had the benefits of having a baby for sort of uh, based on insurance, city insurance coverage. So that was the first one. The other two children were born in St uh, Stanford Hospital. Right. And where, where did you live at that time? Here in, in Stanford, but where? Uh, we lived in uh, Fairlawn. Uh, I mentioned to you that uh, part of the employment package was this two-bedroom apartment. Uh, shortly after Madeline was born, uh, we had our second daughter, Laura, and uh, Laura was... Uh, born also in, uh, lived in the Stanford, in our uh, Fairlawn apartment. And from Fairlawn, we moved here when our third daughter was born, here being Studio Road. And uh, uh, we moved to a house that was built new for us on uh, at identified as 96 Studio Road. And uh, we made the big move from 96 Studio Road to 69 Studio Road as, uh, uh, as a major move. We acquired a little more uh, land, a much prettier view of the Ripawam River and uh, the swimming pool and uh, the interesting part again was we moved on to the site that this Betts of Borgland lived at. I notice a, a river runs through your property. Do you fish? Uh, first year, first day of the trout season you will find if you 
come to our home, maybe 30 or 40 fishermen, uh, right in the river on our backyard. And yes, my uh, I've always trout fished, and the <laughs> condition of my trout fishing is the fact that I won't leave the premises, my uh, property, till I catch the first trout. Then I have permission to go elsewhere. Well, who does the cleaning of the fish? If you do catch one, oh, trout is uh, not a hard fish to clean. But that doesn't answer my question. My wife does a beautiful job. Okay. <laughs> Looking back, is there anything that you'd like to tell us about your experiences here in, in Stanford? Anything else that <clears throat> sticks out in your mind about Stanford as it was, as it is? And perhaps any thoughts about Stanford in the future? Well, uh, I think for the most part we've been blessed with a good political community, good mayors. Uh, I've had the opportunity of having met and worked uh, and socialized with Walter Kennedy who was one of our early mayors, well, during my time, uh, had the privilege of going to basketball games when he became, or well, was the, uh, the commissioner of uh, the Na National Basketball Association. Uh, but in working to develop the uh, community and do the right thing, we have worked with some of the leaders of the community. Uh, and again, I'm impressed with what they have, the uh, offices we've chosen. They're good people. Uh, I think uh, these are difficult times. Uh, I think the, uh, the industries that have come to our Stanford have made us a, uh, a well-functioning community. I think housing is still a problem, affordable housing. Uh, going into affordable housing, uh, I remember working first uh, before St. Luke's where we did volunteer work to build affordable housing. Uh, we spent some time with, with Friendship House uh, because we felt their managing, management was poor. Uh, and that was an interesting challenge. I guess that was more volunteer work than business work. But uh, to uh, maintain a low-cost uh, house housing for uh, poor people in this community uh, and giving them decent facilities was a uh, challenge that I uh, undertook. The future is to survive this current recession. I see my good wife. Yes, we're yes. privileged to have Norma here, and we're going to continue with this interview with Norma Mann, who's in charge of yeah. her home we, and hearth. We permitted her to come out of the kitchen. Good afternoon, Norma. Good afternoon. It's nice to have you here. I'm sorry, I'm very ill prepared for this. Oh, but that, that doesn't mean I'm not going to have a lot to say. I, I think you're going to have a lot to say because uh, actually you're in charge of this home, right? And no, all I, the things yes. that go into it? Not really. Not really. Uh, no. I'm, I'm in charge of laundry and kitchen. I see. Uh, and meal preparing. Uh, my husband is more in charge of uh, maintenance. Maintenance. <laughs> and, uh, well, 
I do take out the garbage on a regular basis. basis. Well, that's very sweet of you. Norma, <laughs> uh, you were born in, in the States, but your parents came from Europe, did they? Yes, or? I'm first generation mm -hmm. uh, American. Where did uh, they come from? My parents come from Hungary, and they came over as kids. Uh, my father came alone. He was the oldest of uh, three or four kids. Uh, left his parents, left his siblings, and uh, struck out for the Golden Land. Uh, uh, what year was that? Uh, about? He was 15 when he came. He, uh, very early on, uh, before, long before the World War I. And uh, my, my father never found the Golden Land. Uh, but he, uh, he was a dreamer, and uh, he read uh, incessantly. He would read two, three newspapers, and when times got difficult during what we call the Depression, which is, happens to be the time that I was born, two weeks after our, my birth, we, uh, the family experienced what the country experienced, you know, indeed. Uh, the crash, and uh, things got very fierce at that time for my dad. Uh, but my mother, who came over at 12, uh, she was 12 years old, and came over because she had prematurely lost her mother, and her father was elderly, and there was one more remaining maiden sister uh, of my mother's. Uh, that. That aunt uh, was unmarried, and uh, they came to the rest of the family. There was a large family of eight or nine that were in this country years before that. So uh, they came over at uh, 1912. Uh, well, my well, grandfather, maternal grandfather, my mother, a kid of 12, and uh, her big sister. Well, what motivated your father to begin with to come over here at 15? I thought I alluded to that. Uh, I, I never got to discuss what I would dearly love to do now, uh, That what motivated him, but I know it was the searching of the dream. It was a restlessness. Uh, he was a planner and uh, he liked challenges and he liked developing and he felt he had some creative and constructive ideas for business, but it didn't work that way. What did he do when he was over here? Well, during the Depression, uh, just up to then, he, he was uh, ran groceries. And uh, when he uh, lost his first grocery, uh, well, long before that, he was doing selling on the road. And my mom wasn't very happy with that. She had a new baby, and that was not me. Uh, subsequently, uh, from that grocery store that I'm talking to, uh, talking about, uh, was right near Yankee Stadium. Everybody, even Stanfordites, heard of the Yankees and the Yankee Stadium. And my mother and he used to go up at night to the rooftop of this apartment house to watch the games. That's how close they were. Uh, but it was a credit business because it was a snoozy neighborhood. And uh, you can't feed your family on somebody else's credit. Uh, so we moved to what is called the east side of the Bronx, which was much less elegant and much less uh, uh, accessible to things that my mother was accustomed to. And she went off to work. Uh, and she became a seamstress in the uh, woman's uh, apparel uh, in New York and took me across town to another aunt who had uh, no children to be cared for. There were no daycare centers. There were no babysitters. You either had help, which we no longer could afford, 
And the funniest thing is that I grew up not knowing that we were poor. New York City is a very rich place. Uh, museums and zoos and, and, you know, the planetarium, all of these things were made available to me. I was beautifully dressed because my mother sewed my clothes. Uh, and she had exquisite taste and very, very skilled hands. She knit beautifully. Uh, my dad uh, went to the labor part of organized groceries. And believe it or not, uh, they mastered uh, closing a grocery store independent grocery store uh, were in an association and they were they obtained the right to be closed on fr on Sunday to have a day off strange isn't it yes how did your parents meet they met uh, in a fraternal uh, social environment where my mother's brothers big brothers uh, had friends, and they would never let her go to a dance unless, you know, she was accompanied, so that's where she met him. And uh, so that was in Yorkville, which is the Hungarian section of, uh, of Manhattan, where they, they lived. You mentioned siblings. Uh, can you I, tell us a little bit about Yes, I have one sister good deal older than me, seven and a half years older. So whenever I discuss the, uh, the lean years of our family, she says, you don't know Norma, uh, because you just blithely went along doing whatever you, know, you wanted to do. You were playing, you were skating, you were you know, playing on the street uh, with the boys. Uh, and uh, I remember things like playing Ringolivio and, uh, and, and being chased by, you know, and we were little at that time. Uh, the street was our playground. Uh, and uh, I never played Immies. Those were boys' things. And I never played Johnny on the Pony. There are games that you didn't play, boys and girls. Uh, but girls would do jump roping. And Had you always like lived in the Bronx uh, as a young I woman? never moved from the Bronx until uh, literally uh, the day uh, after I came home from my honeymoon. It was the first time uh, Milt and I uh, had a great big apartment of two rooms. Well, Milt mentioned that you met at a uh, fraternity uh, party. Yeah. Did you tell yeah. us a little bit about that? And what Yes. What we, life was like at that time? And where did you go to school? Yeah. Uh, when we were in college, uh, I was at a city school, Brooklyn College, and uh, my girlfriends were members of a house plan because they did not have Greek letter societies. And get that camera off. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, they called me up the, uh, that day and said, why don't you come with us to this, uh, this house play fraternity for a dance at someone's house. And I said, nah, it's my sister's birthday. I haven't set my hair. Uh, I really didn't want to go. And uh, of course, my mother wanted me to go. Uh, an opportunity to meet boys is uh, very critical to the mother of, uh, of a teenage girl. So off we went to the party and it was enormously boring because the boys surrounded the television set, that which very few people had. And I, I know exactly the date <laughs> it was and watched the prize fights. It was Gillette something that was the sponsor. And I started to dance with my girlfriend uh, to the records. And uh, somebody tapped me on the shoulder. And that was my husband-to-be. And we had a very quick courtship of about four years. Uh, <laughs> I swept a <laughs> <with> me. <laughs> Where 
we, where we spent our time walking to his subway station when he was coming home from work late at night after having been in school all day or morning. Uh, and then he walked me back home because I actually lived 10 blocks away from him. And I would watch a great comedy show on television. I couldn't give you the name anymore. Jerry Lester. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the Jerry Lester Show. And we would sit on the couch. Mom, Milt's two kid brothers, Milt and myself, <laughs> and watch this one hour comedy show. And then we'd go home. So that's how we visited uh, for a couple of years. We also got to the point where I was finishing school before he was. And so I'd meet him on the subway station and we'd ride, I'd go down to work and he'd go down to school uh, in lower Manhattan. Uh, we came to Stanford, however, uh, when we had, I think you may have said this, uh, we lived three years in Queens in this small apartment right near my big sister and my nephews that were being born. And, uh, what was life, life like in, in Queens in a two-room apartment? Uh, you had one child, I guess. No, we had no children there. I thought you had one child no. before you came to uh, no. Stafford? No. Madeline, Madeline, our oldest daughter, who was 52, happened to have insisted that she is a New Yorker because she was, her birth certificate says the Bronx, because she was born in a Bronx hospital. But she got into the car from the bassinet in the hospital and in my arms rode my car up to Stanford, Connecticut with her brand new crib was waiting for her in our brand new huge apartment of two bedrooms. Uh, and that was in Fairlawn Apartments. Uh, so I say she comes from Stanford, but she says she comes from New York. What was it like living in uh, the Fairlawn Apartments? Wonderful. Madeline had 32 friends in the little backyard. We, we lived on a, a quadrangle with a year, year, rear yard. And all these little toddlers, and most of these women and men became our friends the core of our friends. And uh, she didn't need to go to nursery school. By the time we moved to Studio Road, our children went to the Jewish Center nursery school. There was a difference. There weren't that many children here. Uh, so it was, it was, for me, it was rural. And even though, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a garden apartment development. What sort of work did you do before your marriage and uh, I during your marriage? I can tell you, I was a social worker for the city of New York, New York in the Bureau of Child Welfare at that time. Now it has a much more elegant... And how long was that? Uh, I worked there three years. And then once you came to Stanford, did you have a... a I came to Stanford. Jab per, per se, or did I? Just, when you came to Stanford, <clears throat> you didn't pursue that career anymore. No, I was a stay-at-home mom. Household? I was a stay-at-home mom, and uh, I then had, as I say, less than two years later, my, our second one was born in the apartment, and the third was born two weeks after we moved uh, to Studio Road to our first home which was built while we were carrying her. Uh, and uh, I missed work, but there was no question that I wouldn't go to work. It was the thing to do, to be an at-home mother. That's, that's a job. But I was very restless, and so I very quickly became involved with uh, uh, welfare, of the Jewish community. I tried a uh, League of Women Voters and uh, I didn't feel like pursuing it. 
I was a Girl Scout leader for one year, or a Brownie leader for one year or other, because I had until my third daughter wanted me to do this. Uh, I played ten at tennis, I should say, but I played a regular game of tennis every week. Uh, I did no other sports. Maybe we went with the girls sometimes to go bowling when I had little ones. Uh, but it was the community that attracted me. What was this area like? It's rural today. What was it like then, almost 50 years ago? I can tell you that I was called a stranger when I went to the kosher butcher. And I would meet somebody who was a native. And there aren't that many natives um, our age here, actually. Uh, and they're certainly not here now. Uh, but I saw neighborhood developments going up at the time we already lived in Stanford. So this was undeveloped land all around here. I can remember sitting in this yard uh, because we knew who owned this property that we're on right now and sitting and leaning against a big boulder with a big belly and Milt talking about not only fishing in the backyard but going, we would, we would go to uh, Salem to a, a reservoir and he had a license to fish there and a friend who had a rowboat there. Uh, it, was, it was a small town. You mentioned a kosher butcher. Uh, how many kosher butcher shops were there in Stanford that you remember? Uh, I remember very clearly there were three because my dear, dearest friend used one and Shirley Sklar's uh, father and mother owned the other one and I don't remember the name of the one that I went to. It was a Carp's Bakery. Where was that located? Uh, on Pacific Street, uh -huh. a street that became part of the urban redevelopment that the uh, riches uh, undertook, uh, and you know that accounts for the building that has gone on downtown, and it's really across the street from a hole in the ground that hasn't been developed yet, uh, because the times have changed and have changed once again. Uh, but the Jewish community, uh, first my temple. Did Milt tell you how we chose the temple? No, we didn't get to that. Perhaps you would. I'd love for him to tell you. Is that yeah, all right? It's fine. We, uh, in the Bronx, you went to a temple uh, three days a year. Uh, and you had your bar mitzvah lessons when uh, with the rabbi who had the apartment down the street. Uh, but when we came to Stanford, if anything, I, I viewed myself as, quote, a conservative Jew. But I wanted to go to a temple that would have a, uh, where I could understand more. So I came to the temple, I had my uh, fedora hat on, and I said, is it permissible to uh, uh, come to the temple and wear a hat? I noticed that nobody else was wearing a hat. By the way, the temple, uh, the reform temple we went to was the Sinai that's now uh, where it is. And it was in an old white church. Uh, it was on I Prospect think, Street. On Prospect Street. Anyhow. The two men stood at the thing. The image is still in my mind with red carnations. And they said, you're welcome. And we came into the temple, and the only seats that were open were in the front row. And I was the only person wearing this huge hat. I felt extremely uncomfortable. Uh, never took the hat off and decided that this is not where I want to be. So uh, 
From there, uh, the following year, we went to Bethel, which was uh, in downtown Stanford at the time, too. Uh, that was our first experience in a temple. Do you remember uh, exactly where a Temple Bethel was at that time? Yes, it was. And who was the rabbi? Yeah, yeah. Our, rab our rabbi was uh, Rabbi Perlman and uh, was also on Prospect Street. And it is now occupied. It, it, the temple site is now the Superior Court, but it's right next door to Beis Ben Yuman, and Beis Ben Yuman is in the old Jewish center. And we have lived through all of these changes uh, while we were, I immediately got involved when Madeline was five years old and started kindergarten Sunday school. Uh, I remember uh, making latkes in the classroom for Hanukkah. Uh, I became a co-president of a young uh, couples club so that we could meet people and uh, that dissolved after a few years and the reason it dissolved I always felt was because there was no social uh, no no motivation to work once the social needs were met you can't just say hello and, you know, terrific day and what should we do now? You need to do something for the town. Uh, you need to do something for the community. So uh, I remained, at that point, I got, was already uh, volunteering to sit on the uh, temple board as a sisterhood rep and took an active uh, presence in the sisterhood of, uh, of Temple Bethel. And... Uh, Over the years, what were your functions there? What different... Right up to the top, I became the president of this sisterhood. I then became, I, by that time I was involved with the branch, which is the region of 30 or 31, depending on which, which congregations uh, remained, you know, part of the affiliation with the national movement. And uh, I was active on the national board of Women's League for Conservative <coughs> Judaism, uh, which took us into a place where not only were we, uh, had, had become, as they say, the president of our sisterhood, that's Bethel, we had gone through other rabbis. That rabbi Perlman had retired. Uh, we had a rabbi for a short time by the name of Gold. And then we had Rabbi Goldman, uh, who was rabbi, I think, for 31 years. And it was at that time that a fundraising drive uh, was begun and uh, the present property for Bethel was bought, purchased and uh, a building was a borning. And uh, I, I remember at the time of my presidency that the largest commitment uh, from one of the arms of the temple uh, was made under my presidency and that was uh, a $60,000 pledge paid over five years uh, by the sisterhood, and by golly, it was paid. So there was a lot of work to do, a lot of fundraising to do, and a lot of good planning. Be that as it may, uh, the last thing of, of consequence, that man of the year, former president of the temple, uh, all coming through these same years, and I don't know if you mentioned this or not, no, I did okay. not. But tell me about yourself. Yeah. I'm sure you also got awards from the temple, from other community activities that you did. Don't yes. be modest. Yes, We yes. want to know about it. Yes. Uh, uh, I just wanted to share that uh, 
I became the uh, first woman to serve on the board of trustees of Temple Beth El by being elected after the Constitution had been revised because Mills and I uh, were delegated to be the liaison to the Jewish Theological Seminary of America uh, on, on the side of women's rights and the school ultimately did vote uh, to admit, uh, admit women to the school for the rabbinate. Uh, that was a very special time and uh, I made a, uh, a commitment then, since that went through, that I would demonstrate by being the first woman to have a minion, I mean attend a minion, and I'm still going. So to be are you Hirsch? Yeah, uh, right. You go every Tuesday with Milton, yeah, yeah. like clockwork. Yes. If you're in town. Uh, and uh, that was, I think, a monumental st uh, experience for me uh, to first have an Aaliyah. First Aaliyah. First woman Aaliyah in Bethel. Uh, and uh, I. During that whole time uh, that Milt had been a president, as I say, of the temple, uh, I had been working uh, for Federation. Again, a long history, starting with UGAA and one person sitting at a desk in the old Jewish center, and once a year, on one day, people would volunteer to come down and make the telephone calls. You know, the antecedent to what we today have, of course, uh, with a 25-year-old federation, uh, we have uh, Super Sundays, which is a national thing. Uh, and there, once again, uh, I, I did the gym work. I started at the bottom of the ladder and uh, I was, Milt and I were members of a uh, young leadership group and they had done their work well. I was uh, ultimately women's division uh, chairman, which has now been Peter principled into uh, a presidency, but it's the same thing. And uh, from there I got I was on the board in that right, and then I was on the board as a member of the Board of Trustees of the Federation, and then I became part of the Executive Committee, and then I became the first woman president of the United Jewish Federation of Stanford. So I've been deeply involved and Jewish Historical Society is offering a privilege because that's the cream on the cake. We had no schooling going on. Oh, we, were, we were involved with the developing of a Judaic Studies program, which has become uh, the, uh, we don't call it Judaic Studies, as they do in many other universities. There are about four, 200 universities in the country that have departments like this, schools or departments of Judaic studies. <coughs> and we, it's, we have, for us, it's called the Institute. Uh, and that was because it was a battle with stores. But, uh, What sort of battle are you talking about? It's a very, very delicate situation, uh, working with a university and who doesn't either have the money or says it hasn't the money uh, to fund a program where uh, a bunch of people feel belong. Studying in the university is different than uh, a B'nai B'rith meeting and somebody coming in to speak. Uh, uh, a Hadassah meeting and someone being invited who's knowledgeable but an academician who comes to speak comes from a different place. 
and there were a group of adults who wanted that. It's post, you know, non-matriculating uh, studies. And uh, we got the cream, you know, we didn't have to do the homework. But they came with a, it came with a burden, and the burden was that we had to support it ourselves. And so you and Milton have supported it, I know. Uh, there are many other people who do. Uh, and it is still self-supported and self-sustaining. The only difference is that Dr. Ashkenazi, who is a rather special person, she's a superb teacher, but she's, she's also knows how to create the milieu for uh, a conference where we bring year after year with diverse topics and uh, they change, they're pertinent to what's going on in the world around us. Uh, so it's, it's again, it's a program that I, I was president of for the first, not the first, for its, its beginning, but for five years. Uh, so I, I, I feel, I feel a very deep part of my life was, was spent laboring uh, for these things. And it was very interesting. I made a real attempt at expansion when one year, one year I walked in, and it was morning minion, and Rabbi Goldman was still there. And uh, a present rabbi is with us 18 years, but uh, this was that much before, and said, uh, we're talking about the 70s when all of this was going on and the 60s when this was going on. So it seems like a long time ago. And uh, Rabbi Goldman turns to our Hazan and he says, you know, Norma, I just got a telephone call yesterday from St. Luke's Life Works. You know anything about it? He said, you know, there isn't a Jew has ever been on that board. So I became the first Jew, I just thought of it myself right now, the first Jewish person to sit on a board uh, of St. Luke's. And it was, it was good. I entered another sphere of my life and I spent a good 10 years uh, working with them. What, what? Saint Luke's, Tell us something about St. Luke's work. Life Works uh, has expanded its mission uh, as well. Uh, its mission is... Uh, one of more than uh, housing for uh, single uh, mothers with children. Battered women. Battered women, not so necessarily, honey. That's another agency in town. Our town now has phenomenal social services, and uh, including that. Uh, Battered women generally are in safe houses, and this is not a safe house. It's it's an identified place, uh, but it's a place to start a new life. And there's an education and and teaching skills for parenting, teaching literally skills for working and earning a living, and this happens. So the mission is is broad both towards children and towards uh, families and, and uh, the, the housing now is limited, that is on premises. And Milt, I heard you as we walked by about the uh, affordable housing, which is the next step. Well, that was funny, uh, uh, is in St. Luke's we uh, would do the Christmas dinner, and uh, that was a special evening. For our discussion group. Uh, right. Our discussion group, which was an offshoot, almost the Havarat of Temple Beth El. But uh, we'd have uh, the cantor, Rabinowitz, uh, come and carve the turkey, but in addition 
and said the turkey, he'd have to carve the ham. And uh, we never had the ham. Somebody he walked in with it from the street. So uh, as long as it was someone else's knife, apparently his parents, I think his dad was a butcher. Is no, that it? No, I he, think a grocery man or whatever. So. But he had experience, he said. He said. No problem. But that problem, was one he said, of our, I don't have to eat it just because I cut it. <laughs> But uh, that relates to our uh, fun volunteer days. Well, this is a very, very interesting discussion. And you're both terrific people. Stanford can be very proud to have people like you living in the community. I just have one further question. And I know you're a happy married couple. Do you have any advice to some married couples, young married couples? That you yeah, become that? a volunteer. Okay. <laughs> and Milton? Uh, uh, have uh, Jewish friends who have a good sense of humor. Keep you laughing. Uh, it's a good way of uh, enjoying life and enjoying what you're doing. Well, I wish you both many years of happiness together and good health. Thank you again for being such good interviewees. Our pleasure. Our pleasure.